Ladies and gentlemen, we ask that you please rise. Gentlemen, remove your caps. Here it comes. And face the American flag. Asheville City Soccer Club believes that when all people are treated as equal, no matter who they are or whom they love, we are all more free. Tonight, the Asheville Gay Men's Chorus presents our national anthem. Hey Blues, this is Tim from the You're Smarter Than Us podcast welcoming you to the second Asheville City Rewind. Last month we tackled the men's playoff game against Greenville FC and for this rewind we thought we would take a look back at last year's Pride Night against Beaufort County. With everything that's been happening in the world, but specifically Asheville recently, both the South Slope Blues and the Asheville City Soccer Club hope that all of you watching are finding yourselves useful, finding a, some place to apply yourselves. We know that idled hands can cause stress and anxiety, and we hope for the next two hours we can provide a little bit of respite. But the work doesn't stop, and both the South Slope Blues and the Nashville City Soccer Club want to let you know that we continue to pursue everything that we think makes this um, club and our organization a benefit to our community. The Celso Blues are pursuing our annual Pride Razor event throughout the month of June. If you would like to make a contribution to the campaign for Southern Equality, who is just doing phenomenal and vital work across the South, please visit avl.prideraiser.org. There'll be a landing page that'll take you eventually directly to campaign for southern equalities donation page there is no uh, pledge per goal this year we're, we're just doing a one-time ask after you've taken care of your friends after you've taken care of your families if you have the ability we hope you'll consider making a donation again to an organization that is is solely dedicated to making sure that all of our neighbors have the same opportunities and access to health care, to legal representation, to just the essentialities in life. And we couldn't be more proud of our partnership with this organization. And our work doesn't stop at the end of June. The South Slope Blues will continue to pursue our opportunities in our communities, such as our neighborhood cleanups. We're also filing to become a civic wellness nonprofit. That's a 501c4. This will allow us to take stronger stances in political matters and lobbying and support candidates for issues that we truly, truly believe in. And Asheville City, of course, continues to work towards equitable opportunities for access to the game through their Just Play initiative and donations to the One, One Bunkum Fund. Please get in contact with us if you'd like to join us at any of our opportunities. Now on to the rewind.
And as we get started in the Asheville City versus Beaufort game from last season, I have with me Molly Dwyer. How are you, Molly? I'm good. Glad to be here. Fantastic. Thanks for hopping on with us. Molly, as we watch this game, can you give us a little bit of um, inside thought on how you guys felt going into a must-win game? That's, that's not really something that happen often with Asheville City in the couple of years that we've existed yeah I mean I think definitely a lot of pressure and everyone wanted to do it for the supporters and for for the staff the kind of thing that you have to think about is just do the best you can and do everything you can and leave it all on the field and I'd like to think that we did I mean obviously we got a good result out of it it was a nail biter at the end but um you just have to have the mindset that you got to play the best you can, even though it's a win or nothing. You're <laughs> so um, definitely, definitely a little stressful, but it's easy to overcome it when you have the team that we did. Molly, last season was what? Let's be honest. Last season was not the first season. Um, the first season, if you looked up and down the fixture list and the results, it was just littered with five nil wins, six nil wins, four two wins. Um, I, there was a couple draws, but those were extremely rare. And then coming out of the gate last season, we lost our first three games at Memorial. Um, we, we lost away to the Eagles. Things things were looking pretty dire. To, to give a little context to this game. This was a game where Beaufort County was above us in the table, and if they drew or won, they were going to the playoffs. But Asheville City had to win. A, a draw wouldn't even have even gotten us to the uh, playoffs. What, what do you attribute the early season struggles to from last season? For, for me, so I even came in the season late. I was coming back from England where I was going to school. So I came in uh, on the 1st of June. Um, so I, I kind of missed the first bit of the season as well as I think, you know, we just didn't have the same chemistry as before. And we'd kind of come in, you know, maybe a little bit too confident because we had had such a great first season. We couldn't have had the first inaugural season like <laughs> any better <laughs> if, uh, I'm being honest. Um, so I think it was a little bit of that, but once we kind of had started settling in and kind of got more of a solidified leadership and all of that that's when that's when we started kind of switching it up and having more positive results for sure was the level of comp did the level of competition tick up I would say so yeah I think um Stacy and some of the other staff had worked hard to make it more of a competitive season for us like you said we we did kind of coast through with a lot of fives and six nil wins and not to take any of the credit like from that but we had some great players and we just worked really well together. So yeah, the, the quality was better this last season, but you just have to kind of remember that it's always kind of about how, how the team works together and we just weren't there yet. And so once we kind of had it all settled is when, when it was right. One of the things that fascinates me about the WPSL and I guess tangentially the UWS. Um, I, I don't know as much about that league, obviously, but is that they continue to act as a de facto D2 for women's soccer here in this country. Is it, in your opinion, um, that the individual players, like we had players last season in the first season on the pitch that are going to eventually play professional soccer? And it won't be at a D2 level. Chances are it's going to be at a D1 level. We actually have a player, Jennifer Cujo, who's going to Utah with um, Sky Blue to play professional women's soccer. What is it like knowing that as you play the Charlotte Eagles, as you play, I mean, I guess even the discoveries potentially, that you're running up against a collection of not just, um, you know, high school students that are really, really good and maybe the best in their county, but also potential future professional players? Well, I mean, I think it's always exciting to kind of know that you're playing against people at that high quality and standard. It makes you want to play better. And some of the players that I've played with on Asheville City are, let's just talk Parker Roberts. I mean, she's just amazing. and She's got a cool head and her ability is far beyond some. And being able to play with and against those players just makes you a better player, to be honest. Like, I grew so much the first season. 
at Asheville and I had a long talk with Lydia and Stacy last season just saying how much I feel like I've improved playing with this team and against the standard and it really helped me prepare more when I was going over to England. So let's let's talk about your time in England. You went from I, I love your soccer story in general because I feel like it's a great example of how specifically soccer in the South is becoming more cohesive and progressive. So many might not know that you actually played in the WPSL before Asheville City. Um, can you tell us about your time with the Emerald Force? Yeah, so um, I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, I've been living there now for 20 years. And I um, got a call from some people who I'd known from my club at FC Alliance. And they're like, well, hey, they're looking for a WPSL team. But I know you've been wanting to train. We just need players. And I was like, yeah, definitely. I love playing <laughs> whatever I can do to get on the field in the summer. Um, so played for a couple of seasons there. Um, was all conference with them and had some success. And we made it to the regionals and, and all of that. And it was great. Um, but for me, it just wasn't serious enough. I wanted to be with any team that I was playing for. I wanted it to be serious. I wanted to be able to have the hard training sessions and have the fans and have the games like that. And um, nothing against Emerald Force. They really helped me grow. Um, but it just wasn't there yet. And then that's kind of how it led me to Asheville City because my assistant coach, at Furman knew Lydia <laughs> and so the next season I came to Asheville City and the first game I played with Asheville City we played Knoxville Force <laughs> <laughs> and and I guess while so were you playing for the Emerald Force while you're also at Furman yes I was okay so we you went from Knoxville down to Greenville mm -hmm. um played played for Furman for a bit I I in my head I have this picture of you um because Furman and Western played each other. Yeah. So I, you and Megan being on the pitch at the same time and not even realizing that in a season or two, you guys are actually going to be teammates. Um, yeah. and, and then you come to Asheville City out of, and, and not, you haven't just come to Asheville City. You've now, in a way, made Asheville your home because you were a, an assistant coach for UNCA last year. What is it about Asheville um, you, you've had your, you know, experiences, again, in Tennessee, South Carolina, and now North Carolina. Why, why is it that you've chosen Asheville to kind of make your home in soccer? Yeah, no, um, so I took the job at UNC Asheville right after the season ended. So I was playing with Maya and Jill and Bryson, not even having a clue that I was going to be their coach in a couple months. <laughs> which is kind of funny, but uh, worked really well for us as, a, as our dynamic between coach and player then. Um, but I, there was something about the first season. I mean, obviously, we had a lot of team success, and I was lucky to have individual success as well. But the people and the fans, it's just – it's an indescribable feeling being able to be surrounded by them. During game, pregame – post game at Wild Wings, memories like that are so uncommon and so amazing that it just takes your breath away. I, it, it made me feel like I was home before I'd even like left for England and then a year later came back here. Like when I came back here after England, I knew I didn't want to go anywhere else because it just it was my home. I don't know it, that's the only way I can describe it. It just gave me this feeling of comfort being back here and being around fans who were so supportive of me and of the team and everything that we were trying to do. And we put our heart and soul on the field, and it just it brings you back. And everyone that I've talked to, they, they, they get jealous of the team that we have and the culture <laughs> we have here. And soccer is growing in Asheville. There's no doubt about that. And I think it's just one other reason why – it just fits as me as a person so well. So that's the second time you've mentioned England. Um, can, <laughs> can, can you explain a little bit about um, why you went to England, um, what, what you were playing over there? And can you compare that to, I guess I'm fascinated by the idea of university sports over there because the academy system is so prevalent. 
Mm-hmm. Um, wh- who ends up playing for universities as opposed to who would play in the academy system? So I had graduated from Furman the May of 2018, right before um, coming for my first season at Asheville. And I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I just knew I wanted to keep playing. Didn't know how that was going to happen, where it was going to happen, but I wanted to keep playing. So I talked to a lot of people and I somehow got in contact with the coach at North Dunray University up in Newcastle. And she offered me some money uh, to get my master's and play with the university. And since it's not NCAA, and even though I'd used all four years of eligibility, I was able to go over there and play. So I said, you know what? Get my master's. That's not bad. Play some more. It's a win-win situation. I moved over there in August. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Quick turnaround. I had committed to go there June, left in August. So (laughs) I had no idea what to expect. I talked to a couple of boys who were on the men's side because there was a few of them from England, and they kind of told me a bit about Newcastle and stuff there. And when I got there, the third day in, I had a meeting with my head coach, and she was like, so do you want to play with a club while you're here? Because their practice and their – they're just their scheduling is a lot different. They only train twice a week and they lift twice a week and there's only one game a week. So mm-hmm. you don't really have that much training with the team, but the girls also play with clubs. So they play with when on my team we had girls who played with Newcastle, Middlesbrough, Sunderland. So they'll put train twice a week with them, have a game with Sunderland or whoever it was as well once mm-hmm. a week. So they'll play two games and then have four days of training with them as a total with both club and um, university. So I was like, yeah, I would love to go play for a team. Definitely. So I went and had a tryout at Sunderland. He was in the third tier of women's football over here. They picked me up. They're like, yeah, we love you. Why? We'll get all your paperwork sorted, all your visa sorted, and then um, we'll get you on the team. So super excited about that. Um, Sunderland's a great club and a very high standard. They were in the top, the second, the top tier of the year before, but because of funding issues, they had to drop. And so a month and a half later, my visa, my student visa got denied because they had looked at my past performances in the U.S. and they told me that, that it would look too much as a, student trying to become a professional in the UK and it wasn't um, accessible for me. So it was definitely devastating, but I was able to train with Sunderland still and um, I was able to get to know the girls and staff well. But the people who play for the university, um, there's a lot of English people who obviously come to the US and play. We've got a great university system. As you know, like Louise Griffiths who, uh, came over last year, she played with Sunderland and at the University that I played for. Um, she was one of the best players on my university team, but I'd say it's definitely kind of a level like that. They're just hard workers and they're just so technical players. They're very technical players. Well, Molly, before I go, um, I just want to ask what, what was going through your head as you buried the PK after the ridiculousness of this game? All I was thinking was do not miss. Just hit the free <laughs> the goal. Do not miss. <laughs> Um, yeah, it was definitely a very, uh, how do I put it, interesting setup before the game, the, the pen was actually taken with, you know, the coach being thrown out and just the mess of it. And Stacy called me over. She was like, you're taking this? Like, you're our captain in this game. You need to take this penalty. I said, okay, I can do it. And then everyone, as we were waiting, we're like, you're fine. Just, yeah, you can score goals. Just hit it. I was like, all right. <laughs> and I had, like, my parents were in the, the – the stands which was nice and I just had flashbacks of my dad and I going to a random field in Knoxville and he wouldn't let me leave until I hit 10 in a row on each side so I was like yeah I got this and then I don't remember hitting it I just blank um, <laughs> and luckily went in and just kind of celebrated uh, but I just remember saying hit it on frame please Molly do not go wide <laughs> do not go wide well, I can easily um, say it's probably my favorite goal that Asheville City has ever scored. Molly, thank you so much for hanging out with us for a little bit, and we'll chat soon. Oh, yeah, definitely. Thank you for having me.
And as we move into the second third of the first half, I have with me Josh Blake of IMAVL and Mystery Soccer Theater 3000. How you doing, Josh? I'm doing great. How are you? Fantastic. Josh, I don't think that it would be a soccer fan's first um, assumption that someone who kind of makes their life based around musicians and music would so organically come to um, soccer and come to support what Asheville City has done. Can you explain a little bit about how you became so kind of entrenched with Asheville City and maybe where the um, idea of Mystery Soccer Theater 3000 came from? Um, yeah, well, you know, I, I moved to the area in 1997 and um, I myself played soccer. I grew up in California and I played soccer all through growing up and then played a little bit in college uh, before I left college. Um, so it's always been a big part of my life, soccer and music. And when I, I moved here in 97 and I think it was about 99 when, or maybe 98 when I uh, found out about the ABA SA, which I think only had about six teams back then. Um, and then of course, Bobby, uh, he was running this indoor center that was super awesome. So um, I hadn't really played that much since college, but I started to play a lot again when I uh, moved to the area. And then shortly after that, we formed a club for ABASA, the Smush FC. And then um, <laughs> over years that grew. I mean, at, I think it's peak. We had like nine teams or something and we would go compete in tournaments <clears throat> all over the region. And of course, locally. So soccer has always been a, a big thing for me. I mean, and then, you know, I'm a touring musician. I used to tour all over the country and I'm still playing a lot of gigs around town when we can play gigs and, uh, you know, doing studio work and producing music and stuff like that. So the two have always been uh, just joint uh, habits for better or worse in my life, passions. And um, the way that we came kind of, the way that we developed a relationship with the club is, you know, I guess just from being, uh, long time members of the soccer community here in the first place. And then when we started this uh, web channel to uh, focus on the music and arts community in Asheville, um, we were learning all about live streaming. And, you know, when uh, uh, Beer City Cup, uh, one of the founders of Beer City Cup, Eric Usher, he is like one of the dudes who helped start Smush with me back 20 something years ago. Um, and, and when he started Beer City Cup, you know, after the, it started to gain popularity, he recognized, or I recognized, one of us recognized that there was video streaming capabilities. And so we offered to stream it and we started streaming Beer City Cup and it was a lot of fun. And um, I'm pretty sure that's how we kind of got walked into meeting Ryan and, and, uh, and everybody else at Asheville City. Um, hey, these guys are members of our community who already are streaming some soccer games and streaming is their thing and uh and they're passionate about soccer and so that's that's kind of how that that all evolved um and then uh for us um we i remember sitting with ryan when at the very beginning before the first season started and, and you know he was like who's gonna do commentary and we were like i don't know and we were like i he was like, you guys want to? And we're like, yeah, I guess we could, you know? And so we just, you know, decided to do it. And we were like, we might be a little bit tongue in cheek about it. You know, we're not like ESPN commentary um, professionals, but we, <laughs> we, we love the sport and we love to clown around. So this will be fun if you don't mind. And he was like, no, they've been really supportive. You know, even at the very beginning, we like, we want you guys to make this feel different and unique. And we love the attitude and, um, and, and, you know, you guys kind of picking on the other team a little bit and stuff like that. So they really gave us uh, free reign over, over that side of it. And I think it was after maybe the, might have been the first broadcast or the second one, there's a soccer blog in Atlanta called Soccer Down Here. Mm -hmm. And these guys were paying attention and they listened. And in part of their episode, they were like, they were like, did you guys hear those announcers? They were like, and they, they just started clowning us and they had actually like cut clips of things that we said and started playing them back on their show and one of them was like it's like mystery soccer theater 3000 up in there and so we just <laughs> called them and we were like 
we were like, Hey, can we use that? Can we take that? Can we have that? <laughs> and they were like, yeah, go for it. So, you know, we consulted our attorneys and uh, <laughs> decided that we would risk the lawsuits and just <laughs> our friend made us a graphic and we, we, we rolled with it. So that's kind of how uh, that became what it was. Um, and yeah, it's been a blast. I mean, I, I, I am severely missing this season. Um, I, I, I'm at home a lot more. That's neat, I guess, but you know, I, but, but I'm definitely missing being out there at Memorial. I'm missing seeing our, um, our blues play and, and the atmosphere. And of course, uh, the getting to deliver it to everybody. There certainly is a, uh, love or hate relationship with your commentary. Um, I Absolutely. almost exclusively with Asheville fans specifically, I think they, they're, they're in on the joke, if, if, if I can use that term. Um, whereas opposing fans tend to not really understand because maybe they're only exposed to us once a year. I don't think they truly understand the um, gimmick of it almost. Um, the, yeah post-match Twitter comments about the commentary is always one of my favorite things to go through. Oh, really? I got to go back and check that out. I'll, I'll shoot you if you. I've, ne I've never seen that. But no, I know people <laughs> will hate on us. I mean, they, 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 here's the deal. Like, and I'm, I'm not, um, whatever. We're all getting our, our act together. But like I was, I, a lot of the times we don't have the opposing team's roster. You know what I mean? And if we have anything, it's like maybe handwritten and handed to us like 10 minutes before the match and um, the numbers are wrong. You know what I mean? So it's like <laughs> we, te we after we ran into that, that enough times and we do we do a little bit of research. You know, we, we definitely try to look into our players because we want to know them and be able to say things about them. But, the, you know, when it comes to getting to know the opposing team, um, I mean, I can't quit my day job to research them all day and figure <laughs> out, you know, who these people are before they get to the field. So we're really relying on the information and also that we're given. And also, you know, yes, we are not, we are not professional announcers. We love to watch the game and we love to clown around and that's just what it is. This, oh, hello. Yeah. This, this last, um, this last uh, season, this one's coming up, we were going to actually have another guy join us that is like some kind of, you know, I watched his reel and all this stuff. He wanted to help out. And we were like, hey, you know, he can, he can be there for the people that, that um, want to hate on us for not being like him. <laughs> and, we'll, and, we'll, and, we'll be, and we'll be there for everybody else. <laughs> so that's kind of that's what, that's what we were going to do. But, you know, maybe we'll bring that back um, next, next season. <laughs> Josh, why is it? Why do you think Asheville has the, the fans that do go to the matches, the fans, again, that are in on the joke with your commentary, why do you think they've taken like a duck to water to Asheville City? Well, I mean, it goes without saying that the sport has increased in popularity tremendously in the past 20, 30 years. And I know there have been some other attempts at pro clubs here, there was the splash. <coughs> um, I, I, I know there was a couple other ones, I think. Um, I, I think we're also in the right place at the right time with Asheville, where a lot of people were moving here, you know, like 15 years ago, there wasn't a population here really to support it. I mean, with the advancement of the youth league, now you have all these kids and all these parents and families that are interested in the sport because ABYSA has become so big and so popular. Um, so yeah, general popularity, I think. Um, also Asheville, obviously it's a small community and we, uh, we pride ourselves on being a community and being a community of people who are proud and love to be from Asheville. So all those things combined, plus um, a long-standing adult soccer community, you know, and, and that's been here for a long time. Um, I, I think it's just, the perfect equation for the type of support that this that this club has seen in its first few years. Do you see any parallels between the live music crowd or the embrace of that culture and the Asheville City culture? Well, there's beer at both. <laughs> so <laughs> that's definitely a similarity. Um, I mean, you know, they're both forms of entertainment you know, one is a sport, of course, but um, 
you know, it's something that people can do when they don't have to think about work and all the other problems that are going on in the world. So, uh, you know, Asheville being a fun loving culture, I think that, uh, anything that really is exciting and, and, and enjoyable, the community will latch on to, whether it's music or, you know, some interesting parade or rally or, you know, or sporting event. And yeah, again, I, I think the pride, I think adding the women's team, like we're watching right now, I think that was a huge move. Um, so they broke records, they broke national longstanding records for attendance, and I couldn't be more proud to be from a city and a soccer community that supports its women as hard as Asheville has. And so um, I think everybody feels that. Everybody feels that we're, we're up to good things here and, and we can't wait to get going again. So you've seen almost every game, I believe. I know you've missed a few here and there. Are, th are there any specific games or moments of games that stand out to you? Um, you know, the, one of the ones I think might have been the very first game where Cameron Saul scored a game winner. Um, I mean, just that feeling of we have arrived in the very first game. With, I, I can't even remember when, it, when in the game it was, if it was late or early. Might have been early. I think it was the first half. And then I think he got another game winner that was like a half volley. He came off the bench. I can't remember who we were playing again. Um, but he came off the bench, was on the field for like two minutes, and then like gave us a, a, a game winner. Or maybe it was a 2-0. Maybe it was the second goal. It was the nail in the coffin. But with like some kind of half volley from like 35 yards out. Um, so I missed having him after he left. So uh, it was fun to watch him. You know, Dealey, I really enjoyed. Of course, you know, I'm, I'm OG, so I'm, I, I love all, you know, Elma, all these guys who were around at the beginning. I miss you guys. Um, but I can't wait to see what uh, the, everybody's building for the future for this club. Um, you know, my son's on the academy team. He has been for the last two years. It was wonderful to watch some of the kids from the academy program get to field last season. Um, those are some kids that I've been watching for, you know, since they were six. So that was awesome. And uh, those are probably some of the highlights for me so far. So while we've been sheltered in place, um, I generally save this for the last minute, but it kind of dawned on me that IMAVL has done some amazing work. Um, and I would be derelict in my duties if I didn't let you kind of promote that a little bit because it's provided me some respite on nights that I just desperately want to get out of the house and go to a venue, um, but you know they're still shuttered for the moment. Can you tell us a little bit about what IMAVL has been providing? Right, well, for people who don't know, IMAVL stands for Independent Arts and Music of Asheville. Our website is imavl.com. Um, we, uh, our goal is to preserve and promote the music and art scene in Asheville. Uh, the primary way we do that is by live streaming concerts. So we have live stream installations in several venues around town. We also produce a series called Echo Sessions out of Echo Mountain Recording Studios that you can find on PBS on UNC TV. Um, and, you know, we, we basically highlight the music scene here. We've been doing it since 2012. Um, and during the shutdown, live streaming concerts has become more popular than ever. So we're doing our best to stay active uh, for a little while there we were we were doing restreams every night of old concerts just letting people see a bunch of the old leaf shows and things we've caught at other venues and festivals around town and uh we're just getting back going now we've got a series right now at the orange peel called the orange peel uh called the quarantine concert series that's happening almost every night of the week that we're live streaming to the bands that are playing to nobody but we're still streaming the music um we're partnering with the gray eagle and, and several other venues in town. You go to our website, you can see all the venues that we're kind of connected to there. And if you're bored, hey, thousands of shows in our archives there for you. Go ahead, search for your favorite band. If they're local, we probably have them. If they're not, we might have them also. Um, and, you know, thanks for checking us out. And, you know, when we started imabl.com, we were like, we're starting a media company, but being such big uh, soccer fans that we were, we were like, well, we're only starting a media company because media companies own soccer teams. And so that was our ultimate goal. So getting to actually have our name on the jersey was kind of a, a full circle revelation for us. That, that was a total inside joke. And now we get to sit and hang out and watch Asheville City play 
Thanks for having me, Tim, man. It's been awesome. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Josh. And we'll touch base later in the year. All right, homie. You take care. And now I'm excited to welcome to The Rewind, Bobby Somerville. How you doing, sir? Very good, Tim. Thanks for uh, including me today. Absolutely. Bobby, can you tell us a little bit about your role with Asheville City? I think you may be one of the few individuals that have probably caught every single Asheville City game up at Memorial. Well, I'm grateful for the chance to do it. I, uh, I serve as the PA announcer for the home uh, for all the home matches, and um, it gives me a chance to see games from a great point of view. And um, I'm, you know, Ryan has uh, real graciously included me in that whole process. I've been doing stuff like this in Asheville for a long time, so I was really, really happy that they uh, they brought me in for this. What What are some of those things? I think. What, one of the things that I've done in, in my shelter in place and in my quarantine is I've, I've really started to d- dig deeper into the backstory of soccer in Nashville. I've started to speak to a lot of stakeholders and not just, um, you know, cut across the surface, but really start to dig deep. Um, and it, to be quite honest, Bobby, your name keeps coming up. Can you explain a little bit about the, um, your backstory in soccer in Nashville? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm a old Warren Wilson guy, graduated there in 90, but from the late 80s, really up until present, I've been doing soccer things. Um, I uh, really, when I graduated from college, there were four, there were enough for four adult teams uh, in Asheville to play 11 v 11. We rented Oh, in high school, when it was still a grass field, we play Inca Middle School. We play six on six summer leagues. Um, And I got involved in just um, running little, really so I could play and my friends could play. And um, I ran uh, indoor leagues at Warren Wilson and at Reynolds High School or Middle School or, um, and that led me to um, in the late 90s, opening the uh, Pepsi Indoor Soccer Center, um, which was really, it really showed up at the right time. Uh, I had uh, nine business partners, but I was the most lowly employed of them. So I got to manage <laughs> the indoor center and we were operated for about 10 years. Uh, it was a really marvelous place. Um, two fields side by side artificial grass, which was brand new at the time. It wasn't AstroTurf like old school Astro, uh, like old school carpet. It was the first of the rubber infill kind of surfaces. We had the hockey style dasher boards. Actually, if you've played at, um, at the racket club, those, um, those boards are from the old original indoor center. That's uh, phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, you know, we, um, we did, we fell into, we were trying to find a place to build an outdoor field, which you can imagine is next to impossible. Even 30 years ago, it was hard to find a space. Um, but what we did step into was this, uh, um, old tennis center at, uh, the crown, what's now the crown plaza. And it was in complete disrepair. And the owners of the property were really, really excited about having somebody come in there, clean it up and make use of it and so we played indoor soccer and it was absolutely amazing how many people came to play and what it started uh what it became for the community our um our business name was habitat for soccer we were the pepsi indoor center but you know and i don't know which cheesy guy thought it up to be habitat but really became a place for the soccer community to hang out. We had meeting rooms, office space. Um, We played leagues throughout the year. Our winter leagues had 120 teams in the the winter season, 150 in the uh, holiday season. Um, And, you know, it's really remarkable how much, 
we were there at the right time because um, the Youth Soccer Association was basically being managed by um, basically being managed uh, by Buncombe County Parks and Recreation Services, which really wasn't the way it was supposed to be done. So the Youth Soccer Association came to my organization and said, hey, can you manage, um, can you manage rec registration for us? And so a year and a half into our whole process, we became the place where people dropped off their soccer registrations for kids. Uh, and this was before uh, any sort of online uh, registration process they were paper forms with a check or cash and we we'd make three copies of the form so you give them to the rec coach and the rec uh the district coordinator and the, you know it was uh it was those sorts of things started happening hfc uh which had not yet merged with abysa in a business sense hfc had their own office at our place the Asheville Splash, which is related to what we're watching here, the um, women's W League team um, had an, kept their office at our place. We ran camps and um, it really was, and I don't think I'm overstating it. I, and, it's, and it's not, it wasn't about me, but, um, but we were really right in the middle. We really gave the soccer community a chance to uh, organize. And you know, the, I'm, I'll shut up in a minute, although you do have me on as a guest. The, um, we started doing um, lunchtime kick arounds. Um, and many of your, many, anybody watching will probably be really familiar with uh, the lunchtime kick arounds they have up at Memorial Stadium. And they have them every day now. Um, we started that, I don't remember where the idea came from. It was from another facility somewhere. But it was a um, every day uh, we people would put five dollars in the hat just so we could afford to keep the lights on. But um, and we would play pickup games at lunchtime indoors um, at the Pepsi Center, and it was wildly. I mean, I couldn't believe these people that di don't didn't have jobs or I don't know or had really flexible bosses, but we were playing. <laughs> Uh, lunchtime kick arounds uh, all year long. It was, uh, you know, just little, little stuff like that just started to happen. Um, and we just got organized really quick. And the indoor center had a lot to do with that. So that's exactly what I've kind of discovered in examining the history of soccer in Asheville is that, you know, all the way back, you know, you being an owl, you know, um, Hank, Steinbrecher, yeah, it, it, yeah I... you know the the gentleman, the coach that the U.S. Amateur Open Cup trophy is named after, cut his teeth at Warren Wilson. You know there yeah. is truly in the bedrock of sporting aspirations in Asheville is soccer. So right. You're, you're right. talking about the Pepsi Center, and it sounds like for so long soccer in the city kind of coalesced there. Now, when the Pepsi Center kind of disperses and everybody kind of goes on their different ways, what what were kind of the two or three um, pros to that dysphoria? And what did we kind of lose when there wasn't a central hub? Um, well, I would say that the, what happened first was um, the John B. Lewis, oh, well, uh, Bunker County Sports Park was built in the late, uh, in the early 2000s. And then the John B. Lewis soccer complex came um, somewhat shortly thereafter. Um, the indoor center was the only place to play for the longest time. Uh, again, we had been trying to find a place to play outdoor games forever. And um, the indoor center was accessible to everybody. We had games all the time. Um, I had a young woman named Heidi uh, Freilich was working for me at the indoor center when the sports park opened and she got on, she ended up on the board of the adult. Uh, I don't know whether it was a board or just a group that started managing the outdoor leagues. And it was the early um, formation of ABASA, I'm sure. 
but I realized at one point that I was paying her all this money to create our competition. <laughs> you know, people people stopped playing spring indoor because they had spring outdoor. And my summer league was hard to get enough teams to play in because there was an outdoor league in the summer and there was um, and there were alternatives, um, which in the long run is exactly what everybody would have voted for. Um, and it was it ended up being kind of at the expense of the business model of the indoor center. The, um, but I no nobody looking at it today would have it any other way for me who thought I was going to run an indoor center, you know, basically keys to the toy store um, for the rest of his life. That wasn't um, that wasn't to happen. But where we are now. Um, I, I think everybody would have traded it. It's, it was the form, the, the evolution of the outdoor opportunity um, that is of, of the greatest benefit uh, to the community. There was, there was no way it was going to, um, uh, there's no way it was going to grow and, uh, and be as successful as it is uh, until those projects got done. And um, really that was the, uh, I'm very happy to be, you know, I'm back in the soccer community after being away for a while, working for ABYSA and HFC and um, looking at all the kids that get to play soccer and the adults that get to play soccer. Um, you know, this community is amazing in terms of its uh, dedication to the sport and uh, it's it just, it's a, uh, it's, you know, we're, we're watching a, you know, semi-pro professional level women's soccer match on the, in the background here that um, really is, is a, 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 the, the whipped cre the ice, the whipped cream on the ice cream sundae. It's the cherry on top. It's, um, it's a perfect, uh, um, a, a perfect end result of all the organization that's been going on. And that's why I think personally that Asheville City has legs, I think, because it truly is that culmination of everything you talked about. It sounds like it so much of what happened. You know, I've heard um, Joel Burgess, the WLOS uh, reporter, talks about or maybe he's with Asheville Citizen Times, but he talks about the the infamous Warren Wilson um, co-ed games that they used to play out there and you know there was this kind of like centering of all soccer activity that happened for a long time and it kind of sounded like just like you were describing it went here it went there the youth went this direction the adult amateur leagues went this direction the indoor kind of went by the wayside and Asheville City is kind of the, tying all of it back together again. Uh, almost every game you can see different representatives, whether it's yourself up in the booth, whether it's Jono down on the feet, you know, down on the sideboards cheering on, whether it be some of the um, higher level adult amateur players playing for Asheville City. Um, I think it's just bringing it all back together. And I don't see any one aspect of it um, suffering or um, in... A situation where it may go by the wayside and so long may Asheville City continue and while I've got you for about five more minutes Bobby let's let's talk about some of your favorite Asheville City memories since you have been there for almost every game are there any games that stand out to you as um, just when you think of Asheville City they're the first few that jump to mind <clears throat> well um, these pride night matches have been remarkable um, and uh, in part because, you know, I've known Stacy for a long, long time and uh, Megan, um, they were part of that original, that Asheville Splash W League team that I was the, uh, uh, I was the public relations website guy. I did all that <laughs> uh, stuff for that team. And um, Ryan Kelly had me digging up memories about uh, indoor soccer and all these other things. And I found um, team photos of the splash and individual headshots of Stacy and Megan and uh, Lydia. And, um, and so they, 
really laid it down. Um, Steve Woody was the owner uh, director of that group. And, um, and it was the talent uh, available that um, Stacy had an awful lot to do with. And then the, the cohort of, um, uh, of Lydia Vandenberg and her team, her, uh, the HFC team that she was a part of had a number of division one players um, uh, that um, really formed a, a nice solid base of local talent who could play. Um, and that's the, and maybe they were 10, they were 10 years early, you know, and they were never going to serve beer at the games because of the, um, but uh, the women's team, especially um, has that uh, local, you, you know, who those players are and, um, you know who those players are and it's anyway so this pride night is really all about stacy and megan and and um and their uh role in the community and so i'm i'm a big fan is there a specific goal that stands out in your mind <clears throat> um well i tell you what this very game <laughs> if you, if you, if you, this very game it's a goal that takes 10 minutes to score. Um, but, the, um, you know, I, I, I pull for Ryan Kelly's um, mental health in all these games. Um, I want there to be, you know, at least 15. I want, you know, when he sends me the, <clears throat> the attendance for tonight's match and I get to announce it, I really want to see a nice hefty number. And then I want to see a win. I want to say, um, those guys have taken such a risk and spent so much energy and time. And, um, it's just, uh, I just pull for them to get some W's. And so anyway, uh, if people would be wise enough to stick around and watch the end of this match, <laughs> um, where the, uh, the Buford coach and his assistant both get tossed. Police, um, police escorted. <laughs> police escorted. It was glorious. glorious. And, um, and, you know, they were under the impression, and, it, and I was trying to make the point to the guy, they were under the impression that if they left, then the game had to be forfeited, and the game was going to be over 0-0, zero, zero, and they were going to make the point, whatever. But, um, but to see the team, to get a goal that late and, and win a game on Pride Night, and not, uh, such a huge crowd, um, I think it was a this was it was a beautiful night. Absolutely, we've had quite a number. I think off the top of my head, two or three games between the men and the women that um, it's come down to a PK in the last maybe like five ten minutes, and this was one of them. So, Bobby, while I've got you for about another 30, 45 seconds, um, is there something you or your family have done while we've been sheltered in place and not been able to be together together that you've used to um, pass the time? Well, uh, I'm a newlywed and I have spent, uh, we, my wife and I have spent a lot of time working at home, um, you know, back to back in the office. Uh, and that's been marvelous for us. And I'm, I, I'm grateful for uh, a beautiful life. And I look forward to getting back to playing myself and working in a regular environment. But, but I'm a newly happily married man and I'm trying to take advantage. Well, thanks so much, Bobby. We'll be in touch. Tim, thanks for your time, sir. Oh, win the blues! Oh, win the blues! Go march in! Go march in! Win the blues! Go march in! Oh, how I want to be in the number! Oh, win the blues! Go march in! Guys, now we're heading into the second half of last year's game against Beaufort. Again, guys, to kind of set the scene for this game, this was a um, winner take all. Whoever won this game um, was going to the playoffs. Asheville City specifically needed to win. Beaufort could have made it with a win or a draw. And for the first time, I have with me all three owners of the women's team. Um, and actually they're owner of Asheville City now. Um, Lydia Vandenberg Jackson, Megan Burke, and Stacy Enos. How is everyone? 
Doing good. Hey, Tim. Yeah. Tim, Tim. So guys, I, I want to, I've, I've reached out and talked to each of you differently on the podcast and in person about how the three of you specifically came together. And it all goes back to Steve Woody and a previous amateur soccer team here in Asheville, the Asheville Splash. Other than searching on like old newspaper clippings and uh, conversations from some of the individuals that were around at that time, I can't really find out much about the Asheville Splash. Can you guys describe a little bit of the environment that was around women's soccer in the early 2000s and why women's soccer actually made sense in Asheville in the early 2000s when men's soccer maybe didn't? I was like, Tim, did you say you were searching microfilm? Because, like, it wasn't that long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Liddy, you grew up here. I feel like you should answer that one. Yeah, I mean, you know, it was so formative for me, I think, just being able to play. Somehow we assembled, Stacy probably knows more, how we assembled an amazing team of amazing women from all over. Um, and it really, it really uh, stuck with me just in terms of being able to play soccer in a different way. And what I mean by that is we had a lot of players who had just such technical skill and appreciation for the game and the style of play. And um, I really just fell in love with the game. So I was so thankful just to be a part of that, that group. You know, Stacey, you gonna, were already here, right? Well, I had just moved here in 01, 2001. But, you know, I, I feel like soccer on the collegiate front had taken off, um, you know, and, you know, Liddy's kind of mentioning that the flair we had, we had a lot of variety of players. Um, you know, Brevard was, was notorious for having a, um, a great connection with uh, Trinidad and, um uh and just you know unc asheville a lot of the warren wilson just a lot of local small colleges and you know you're coming off 96 when the disclosure act you know got more colleges to be forward with funding for women in soccer so you know i think it, it, everything was taking off 99 world cup team winning um so i think it was definitely on the rise and then steve woody um, loves the game of soccer and played the game of soccer and had daughters. So I think his appreciation and love for the game is really what kind of culminated this uh, to where Asheville Splash became this uh, amazing story out of this small mountain town. What was the reach and scope of the W League at the time? Was it comparable to the WPSL or – what was it more concentrated talent wise? Uh, you guys want me to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it was better, frankly. Um, the W League had uh, a, a much higher standard, I think, from team to team, more consistency. Um, I had played in the W League in 2000 in Fort Collins, Colorado, and then in for the Memphis Mercury in 2001 and 2002. And then the WSA folded in 2003. I played in that. And then what, what you see is that the W League, when there wasn't a fully professional league, the, the W League is where those players played. Um, so when the WSA folded, a lot of the players that constituted what was then the best league in the world went and played in the W League. The WPSL was actually more concentrated, um, probably more in California. W League had a presence in all across the U.S. and in uh, Canada. Um, and so, you know, I think I remember Hampton Roads, you know, was one of our, our big Phew. competitors, yeah. Yeah. Charlotte Eagles. Um, you know, that was when the Boston Renegades were around. I played for them after the splash. Um, so, you know, in some ways it's a tragedy that the W League folded because it's such a huge part of the history of the women's game and Asheville was definitely a part of that. When the, when the splash went away in 2003, 2004, what, what happened to the women's game here in Asheville? What's that? 
Lydia, you you didn't stay in town. You actually moved on. Um, where did where did you happen to go after Clemson and um, after the splash? Uh, well, I was still in college when the splash folded, so I actually ended up playing a few seasons for the Charlotte Eagles um, in the summers. A lot of my Clemson teammates had were playing on that team, and so I had a lot of good connections there. Um, but then right after college, when I graduated in 2006, there was still no women's pro league. So um, I got the opportunity to go to Brazil and play down there for two seasons, which was fantastic. And Stacy, you remained in town and were at Warren Wilson at the time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it was, you know, it was sad when Splash folded um, because I think, um, you know, I'd, I think it was the right idea and the right concept, but just, you know, Asheville wasn't organized as a soccer community quite yet. Um, you know, we didn't have this umbrella of just structure and leadership. And so we had a lot of people doing a massive amount of work, you know, the Woodies, the Corleys. I mean, it was, uh, it was a labor of love and, um, and, you know, I also know it was an expense, you know, for them as well. So, um, so it, when they, when, when Splash folded, it was, yeah, it just, it got quiet. Um, but I think that's when we started getting the co-ed leagues and the, you know, the leagues just finally started getting organized here in town. But obviously I think, you know, we didn't have, like, I'm watching this game that's on the screen and it's just really good soccer. You know, mm -hmm. I was just really impressed by how we're playing. And um, it was sad that it wasn't there. You had to travel to go catch a game at this level. So, Megan, you didn't stay in town either. But I remember a certain Novaks in St. Louis circa 2000. Can you hear me? Are you mm -hmm. there? Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you didn't stay in town for the entire time. You left for a little while, correct? That's right. So, I had moved to Asheville in 2004 to play for the Splash. And then I went and played in England um, from the fall to the spring, 2004 to 2005. I moved back to Asheville. Um, and then I moved to St. Louis and played for a WPSL team there in 2006 and 2007. Um, then I started law school in Boston and played for the Boston Renegades in the W League in 2008. Uh, I had spinal surgery and couldn't play in 2009, um, and so in 2010, I played in Chicago and New Jersey in the WPS, and then came back to Asheville uh, late 2010. And what, when you came back in 2010, what was your impression of the sport in the city? I caught the first part. What was the last part of what you said? Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. When you came back in 2010, um, what was your impression of the sport in the city at that point in time compared to what you had left years That's, before? Well, first of all, I think our youth scene had grown immensely. Um, you know, when I, when I was here in 2004 to 06, I had coached for HFC. Uh, I coached in the go to goal program. Um, but we had a relatively small classic girls program at HFC uh, and kind of a, a budding challenge program. Um, but it hadn't yet totally been integrated, was my memory. I'd worked fundamentals camps with Shane Weems. Um, it's cool to see those still going on. But, you know, there wasn't ABA say as we know it now. There's, you know, there was the indoor center. Um, so there was, it was all the pieces were always there in Asheville. I just feel like it needed to be put together like a puzzle. And uh, when I came back in 2010, late 2010, Carolyn Warhiftig had me come in and coach the challenge program. And I was like, whoa, like it was just totally different. You know, you had John B. Lewis, which had just been built when I left. Um, and so that provided sort of a home base. Um, Jasmine says hi. <laughs> uh, you know, it was, a, it was definitely more organized. Um, I'd say the adult soccer scene was, was awesome. And the, and the pickup scene, frankly, having Memorial – where the pickup scene played, you know, there was always pickup, but like you could reliably find a game every day um, at Memorial around lunchtime. So I kind of loved that. Uh, and that was relatively new. I got in with the adult rec league and um, the first couple years I was back, it was like hard to latch on to the league. But then I feel like even from 2011 to 13 or 14, that even got better. 
and grew. Um, and so, you know, I was just joking earlier, I, I seem to recall a late night at Novax in St. Louis back in 2009, I think it was it, no, 2008, <laughs> before Liddy was playing in Chicago. And yeah, it was a very late night. <laughs> and uh, I remember the three of us, um, completely sober and clear headed, of course, we're making plans um, to start to bring a W League team back. Oh, you, James, you got, sorry, guys, my son's showing me his awesome jammies. This is what Zoom brings you. Sorry. Um, so we, uh, yeah, we were making plans to try to bring the splash or some version of it back even in 2008. And so when the men's team launched in 17, like felt like, you know, there's a decade or more in the making. Lydia, when did you come back after Brazil and after your professional stops? Um, I moved to Asheville 2010, 11, somewhere in there, like in between in my off season of still playing. Um, I knew I always wanted to be back in the area of obviously my family in Brevard, but I, I just loved Asheville and, you know, kind of around that time when I was coming back, um, I connected with Stacy and that's kind of, she invited me to come out to Warren Wilson and it's amazing how growing up in the area, I still didn't know much about Warren Wilson and she said come on out and I did and was like what is this place it's amazing and so I just kind of stuck around. yeah go Hooters <laughs> <laughs> so at now now we're firmly in the 2010s um obviously Asheville has figured out and organized the um both the adult and the youth game and we're, we're building towards something a little more organized at kind of, you know, the top of the city pyramid, I guess you could say. But what was the women's game in general doing across the country that made um, the WPSL more attractive to you all? Who wants to take that? Mm. I mean, I'll jump in and then y'all can talk over me or just tell me <laughs> so um I, you know what's notable is that we're now as of 2020 in the third third iteration of women's fully professional soccer so you had the wsa from 2001 to 2003 then you had wps from 2009 to 2011 2012 there was no fully pro league but there was this like wpsl elite model that was intended to be kind of a stopgap measure until the next league launched um, and then in 2013, uh, NWSL launched, which is now still going. Um, w League folded in, was it 16? I feel like I could be wrong on that. It's, it was around then. Um, and so WPSL kind of rose to be the, the only league in that space, um, you know, between a fully pro system and, you know, what do you do after a youth club uh, or college soccer? And so it was sort of a pro-am, more am, really, uh, model that was attractive to us because we feel like Asheville being, you know, we're, we're a very strong soccer community relative to our size, but we're still kind of a small town. And so we kind of fit into that middle level, um, not quite, you know, the big city for NWSL, but certainly an avid soccer following that's going to really fill the stands and support a team. Lydia, did you think as you guys were heading towards um, speaking to the six um, uh, owners, original owners of Asheville City, that there was a wellspring of support for the women's game here in Asheville? Oh, for sure. And I think, you know, just the success that the Splash had, you know, was still there. And like, like Megan shared, you know, we had conversation in 2009 that us three were going to be a part of bringing the women's game back. And I think the reality of all of us being back together in Asheville, then we, you know, really started to formulate plans and, and really say it's got to be us. You know, one, as women players, you know, we, we want more women coaches and more women owning teams. And so we knew that we had to be, we had to do it for our city. Um, and so then we kind of met Ryan and all the other owners. Um, and Did, did was, you was, know that they were coming in, in 2016-17? Yes. Well, so we had, we kind of had plans to launch that same year. Um, they were further along in the process. 
Um, and so we had kind of met and had a great conversation and, you know, kind of joined at that moment and, you know, felt like it was the right direction to launch the men's team first since they were very organized. And then we would, we would learn from them. And then the second year we would, you know, all together launch the women's team. Stacy, when, when you guys launch and as part of the just um, play initiative and um, providing equity into the women's side of the game, I think one of the things that caught a lot of fans off guard was the first year of the men's um, with Gary Hamill as coach. And I'm assuming most of our players came from his uh, recruiting process. It, we had some all-stars out there. We had some amazing players out there, but the team as a whole struggled coming together for the first time. Um, Gary, you know, lasted one season. And so I think a lot of us expected the women to experience similar growing pains, similar um, a, a steep learning curve, if you will. And we experienced the complete opposite. Um, how, what do you account our fantastic recruitment and our just stellar performance on the pitch, especially that first season, too? <laughs> really? <laughs> Come on, Tim. You know, well, first, you know, you could hear Megan and Lydia talk about their experience in the leagues, various leagues all over the world, and um, and in college and, you know, I'm, I'm the old timer, but, you know, I have my hands in a few pockets and I ride on their coattails as well. So, you know, we had, I think there, so one is just, you know, name recognition, who we are. Um, but, um, but we, I think the other difference is the women's side had, Megan, Lydia, and myself, and we were like jumping out of our skin. So every time we picked up the phone and called somebody, it's like if their player didn't, I mean, their players were fools to not want to come play with us, right, guys? I mean, we <laughs> sold experience because we had, I mean, everything was exactly where it needed to be. And it was really easy to put Asheville City in front of a lot of high quality coaches and players and sell our program and sell who we are and sell, you know, what we could bring and what we could pro provide because of experience, knowledge. Um, you know, we had the men's team, we have our city. So it was, it was really easy. And it really just happened to be that we had, you know, we had, we just had assembled an outstanding team. I mean, that first team really should have gone all the way. I mean, it was, there was no reason, um, except that we suffered some injuries and, you know, had some setbacks, but. Um, I mean, Tim, I can tell you being on the receiving end of a recruiting call um, in 2000 through, uh, 2004, Steve Woody was like, would you want to come to the mountains play soccer? And, and uh, I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I might come out. You know, I, I wasn't doing anything. The league had folded. It was jobless. <laughs> um, so I thought I might come out a couple months early. And I was like, is there any way, you know, be there a job for me or, you know, something I could do if I came out like in February, March to train and get ready for the season. And so he had Stacy call me and I'd never met Stacy. And I'll never forget sitting in the back seat of Christine Signo's car in St. Louis. We're driving through, we're, we were looking for first watch to go to breakfast in, the, in uh, Clayton. And I remember, like, I get this call, and it's an 828 number, and I'm talking to Stacy, and I have no idea who this person is. She sounds like a whole lot of fun, but I really don't know her. And so she's like, well, tell me about you. I was like, well, so I was drafted to play in the WSA. You know, it's, it's, um, it was the women's – I'm used to explaining. Like, it was the women's fully professional league. And Stacy just goes, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I kind of helped start that. <laughs> <laughs> that was a quote. And I was like – Oh, these are my people. Like, I don't, have, I don't have to do the thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, We're your people here. <laughs> and I was like, and then, because this was like pre-Google, really. I know that sounds, but it was like, and then I was like, oh. Like, <laughs> so I think, you know, for players who get a lot of calls, especially those, you know, the Parker Roberts of the world, you know, a lot of coaches would trip over themselves to bring a player like that. You know, I think what we're doing sells itself. Um, you know, we don't have to, we can just tell them who we are and what we're about. And then you either want to come or you don't. And if it's inside you, you'll naturally want to come here. 
I think too, like Stacy has an unbelievable way of just like uniting a group. And oh, I, gosh, it is. I mean, I wish, I wish you all could see inside our locker rooms at times. Or sometimes <laughs> I, I wish you couldn't, but <laughs> right. But so I think it's part of it is like bringing in players, but then, you know, you know, following through and, and really creating a team environment, a family environment, really caring about players, um, their growth, you know, not just trying to win a game. Um, and, and Stacey really set the foundation um, for us to be successful. So everybody wanted to come back. They had the best time of their life, you know, and, and it's amazing. Thank you. Well, one of the things that really surprised me too, looking at that first year's roster and it continued into the second year was the difference compared to the men's, which was uh, very squarely current college players and then maybe one or two just post-college players that um, still had professional ambitions potentially, but still needed kind of a, a something to do in the summer when they weren't coaching, maybe a youth club. But the women's roster straight out of the gate and the second year it continued do, being the same thing was this wonderful cross section of high school students, college students, and post-college students. What 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 led to that kind of grouping as opposed to some of our competitors in our leagues, which are, you know, if for a lack of a better term, maybe high school all-star teams or um regional teams, city teams where people have gone away to college and this is just kind of what they come back into town to do over the summer. Stacy, was there something specifically that you wanted to do to balance that, um, the scale of um, youth and experience? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, when, when you're on a team and you've been on teams over the course of the years and you want to find um, players who have the experience and the knowledge um, and the maturity to, uh, you know, manage the tough times, uh, um, to help a team grow and move in the right direction. Um, you want to balance. I mean, the youth right now are amazing. They're fast. They have a lot of energy. They're eager to learn. So you want to find the right youth to bring in to – because you know you're going to have them over time in your club if you do it right. Um, and then, uh, you know, balance it with the locals um, who who are also big-time contributors and, you know, they have their connection as well in town. So, um, and then the big thing, too, is to, to be appealing enough to attract some high-end college players. Um, you know, our – our goal is to be a door and an avenue for players to make the pro leagues like Jennifer Cujo um, we just got that announcement. So, um, and uh, you know, we want, we want to be this, this tier into the next level. So, so I do think um, spreading it out and having a nice balance and helps the whole system work, helps the team stay cohesive, um, gives uh, the youth, someone to look up to. Um, I mean, when people step onto the field and they're playing next to, you know, Megan Burke or Lydia, Van Lydia Vandenberg or a Sarah Jacobs um, or a Parker Roberts, you know, their eyes are wide open and they're working twice as hard to, uh, to just really, and, you know, be a part of the game and enjoy the game. And so it's, it's, it's exciting. That first season ends in a 3-2 loss against Oak City in the, the silliest of the silly fashions. Um, like, really, Tim? Uh, <laughs> the, um, the, We're in a global pandemic, but, you know, we need to have <laughs> The um, one goal that Bryson lets in that I, I, I don't know, Megan, I don't know how a keeper can – possibly train for a ball coming down at a 90 degree angle on top of their head in the wind um it it was just such a shame I mean it was 101 degrees down there and leave it to another you know fairly world-class keeper um from UNCA to to stop Asheville's momentum but I <laughs> I, I I think everybody went into the second season 
with not just high expectations, but, you know, national championship thoughts and um, final eight, final four expectations. And we, we didn't quite get that. Um, if, if you had to put your finger on one or two things, right. um, is there anything you can narrow down? Was it um, bringing in Lisa Marie Woods, um, which didn't quite seem to work out? Was there a change in the roster? Was um, the change in competition with the Eagles coming into our side of the table? But was there anything specifically that you thought led to that, you know, struggle of the first half of the season? I'm empty, so I'm <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lydia, what are your thoughts? You, you spent much of last no, season kind of on the outside of things. Yeah, I mean, I want to say it it's because I wasn't on the field. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <it's true. laughs> um, no, I mean, I think it's when you have such a really good season, it's 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 hard to repeat that, right? And and you know the expectation, you have the pressure on you to perform that same um, at that same level. And you know, I think it took us a little bit longer to come together as a group um, and find out who we are you know, missing, you know, different players and having new players in the mix. Um, and so, you know, Lisa, I think, is a fantastic coach. She knows the game in and out. And I think a lot of our players were challenged, um, you know, in their soccer knowledge. Some maybe didn't really understand the way that she wanted us to play. But I think looking back, I think all of them definitely grew. Um, but, you know, it's, it's hard in such a short window um, to really treat it like a college team where you have time to really talk about different styles of play and different formations. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I just think it was just a different season. Stacy was, I, I know, I mean, personally, the Celso Blues missed seeing Brooke Bingham out there, but was there any other roster changes from the first season that you think led to maybe a lack of cohesivity or um, challenged us in certain ways? Yeah, you know, Brooke, Brooke was, um, yeah, Brooke, Brooke is a huge miss. Um, one is because she's a vocal leader. Um, she's a big personality. Um, and, you know, when we're talking about putting your, your roster together, you're looking for those kind of players. Um, you know, so I think, you know, not having uh, Brooke in the back was was definitely a big hole. And and we had great defensive players, but we also had kind of quiet, quiet defensive leaders. But was that you know that that was a big hole for us. Um, and you know, we just and and I agree with Lydia. Like I think Lisa is the X's and O's are dialed in and she had a big summer going back and forth to work and then she also got married so we were having some gaps and so we were trying to fill in the gaps and um and uh you know i think that's where it just you know the season you know the the team wasn't quite as bonded as as they were the first year so you know it just took a lot more people to be a little bit more um you know kind of uh, self-reliant in that instead of needing kind of leadership. And I think we, I had hoped that we had had enough glue to make that happen, but it didn't really seem to uh, pan out that way. So yeah, people come and go, you know, some people don't come till June. So it's, it's hard, you know, you almost have a whole season in May and then you have people come players coming in. So yeah, it's a lot Megan to manage. Megan, what do you account for the turnaround in last season then? Um, I believe we just started kind of taking in the right direction before you headed off to France. Did, did you visually see something? Did you see a sea change in leadership or um, team mentality? I mean, the easy answer is it was Stacy. Stacy um, stepped in the head coach role and just kind of took charge and, uh, I mean, it's hard not to love her. You're talking to her right now. Like, the team just – I feel like, you know, their better selves came out. And, uh, you know, I've played on a lot of really good teams. I've played on some dysfunctional teams. Um, 
And sometimes when you're at a low point, you really need that strong leader and personality to bring out everyone's better selves. And I think Stacy did that at a critical moment. Well, thank you. And let me just say, I don't have a lot as much pressure as me hiring a coach. So, you know, for me, it was easy to go in and say, hey, let's just play. Let's everybody give 100 percent, you know, and leave it all on the field. So it's, it was just a different approach. I think players felt like they could breathe and not have the pressure to win. Um, and, you know, I think it definitely makes it, you know, it changed, it changed a little bit of the um, – what they were feeling so but thank well, you I think that's a good point I mean you know part of what's challenging about the league we play in is that it's a very compressed schedule and a very tight season you don't have the kind of time you do in a or even in a college season where it's stretched out over nine or ten months or six months or four months and you've got you know two months of preseason or whatever I mean you literally show up and you might play your first game the next day and so there's two things that you really need to as component parts to be successful. One is, you know, a strong core of players who also return year after year so that they can set the culture and the expectations in the squad outside of the presence of the owners and coaching staff. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is you need just people who can, who can come together and play, you know, it's like show up and play. And what Stacy was able to do is just like put all the, I think we got lost in the weeds a little bit. We had a really talented squad, but we just, we couldn't find ourselves because we got kind of, we overcomplicated things. Mm -hmm. Such a exactly. short season, you know, you got to keep it simple. You got to go out there and just play. Um, and you can't overthink it. And there's no time. So I think that's what Steve back, brought the game back to, you know, its roots and its basic component parts and players were able to simplify. And I think we had better success with that. Stacy, did you change anything tactically in, yeah, we, in, in bringing it back to simplicity and kind of to its roots? Was there something that you reverted to or centered everyone on? Yeah, we definitely simplified the game um, and just kind of tried to keep the ball in front of us and, you know, went more to, you know, like a four back, but we always maintained, you know, kind of three in the back and, uh, so we changed a little tactics um, and then, you know, just, uh, you know, just more attacked in numbers and defended as a group. Um, so, yeah, we, yeah, just kind of simplified it, I think, a little bit. Um, went back a little bit more to what we played last year uh, or the first year, which I think was more familiar with some of the players, uh, with the majority of the players. I think, too, we realized we wanted Molly Dwyer on the ball more. The more that we could put her in a position where she could be connected, um, she would change the game for us. Um, and we, we just felt like she was at times, you know, just hanging out on the flank or, or you know, just not in good opportunities. So we really tried to find a shape and a formation that was kind of built around her. How could we find her? How could we get her more involved? And things started to open up. Was there a player from last season that surprised you that kind of came out of the blue and contributed a bit more than maybe you had expected? I, I personally, one of the ones I know that the South Soap Blues were constantly kind of shocked by was Maya Poplin. Um, and she came to us, if I'm not mistaken, from Beaufort County, correct? Mm -hmm. um, yep. And she was still a high school student. Um, how, how does that recruitment process come? come about. Uh, I think Ryan actually told me an interesting story of who maybe just first noticed her in the first season. Lydia coached her when she, you, you, didn't you coach Maya and Charlotte? Uh, yeah. I coached ODP in South Carolina when she was probably 12, Carolyn and I, um, her and Charlotte McClure. Um, and so that's kind of how, you know, we've just kind of stayed in touch and, you know, they, they were, they heard about what we were doing and, Obviously, Maya, you know, had played against us the year before, and she wanted to join and thought it'd be really good for her development. Yeah, and it, and we scored Charlotte. So I do think Maya had a great season, and I, I also think Charlotte McClure had a, a breakout season last year too. She was definitely um, more uh, more hungry on the defensive end of the ball. Um, she got forward at the right time in the right spaces, I thought a lot this past year. So, um, you know, I think our, our youth 
our and Cam Cameron Bullock too. I think I think our youth really picked up the game for us a lot last year. So on the screen, um, and and we don't refer often to what's happening on the screen, and we won't run play by play on it. But this is, of course, the infamous game last year where there's a handball and then the Beaufort coach comes onto the pitch and makes a scene. He's eventually ejected. The police end up having to escort him out. Um, it, it's probably the silliest red card situation um, because him and the uh, assistant coach both get red carded and kicked out of the game. And in thinking of speaking to you three, I, it automatically popped into my head to ask you what the silliest red cards you guys have seen throughout your careers. Um, Megan, is there a red card situation or a, a hand handball situation that you've come across at some point in your career that just still to this day makes you laugh? Well, it's funny. When you, when you asked the question, the first thing that popped in my mind was when I was, I want to say I was like, I was a kid and I came out and a lot of the field wasn't marked, of course. And I it was a breakaway and I made a save and it bounced off my chest and went out of bounds. And the ref thought I was out of the box and gave me a straight red, but then he was short a linesman. So then he handed me a flag and asked me to go be his linesman. <laughs> hey. I mean, bullshit call, but sure. Okay. <laughs> you should tell your adult league red card. Oh God. <laughs> I mean, that was not bullshit, though. That was just <laughs> uh, Yeah, that one's funny. I was playing with Autumn Trauma, who I'm sure you know from years of, at Asheville City Games. And Trauma was our goalkeeper, and I was playing for UJ on the women's team. And I, I think it wasn't long after – you know, I, I have a rule that I don't play in goal in rec games. It just, it just doesn't work. I just don't. Um, so we're in this chaotic situation where we're trying to clear the ball, and I'm playing in the back, and it's one of those things where – Autumn comes out for line, and so as a defender, I tuck in behind her on the line, and uh, we were playing Sterling Barlow's team, and I forget who took the shot, but someone just rips one to the upper corner, and I just blacked out, and I just leave my feet, and I, like, palm it in midair in the top left corner. I mean, I, like, palmed it. I was jacked, and I caught it, and then as I went down, I was like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so I literally, like, I landed, I got up, I walked over, I put the ball in the penalty spot and I walked off the field. <laughs> and Ed was like, thanks for not making me get out of my red car. <laughs> and you know, the, in a true sportsman-like fashion, Sterling filed the appeal, appeal for me. She's like, it wasn't intentional because it was completely instinctual. <laughs> they denied the appeal. I had to sit again. <laughs> Stacy, do you have one that stands out in your memory? Oh gosh. I don't know. I can't compete with that. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. You know, what's interesting about, um, uh, the coach, uh, getting thrown out is his son is the assistant coach. Um, <laughs> yeah. Did you know Mike and, and, um, De Declan or what? So at any rate, so, they did. They had this agreement that if you don't have a coach or an assistant coach, you can't finish the game. And so they both get launched. The police get them out of here. And they were like, it's a rule. It's a rule. And it was just like, it's not the sportsmanship that you want in a game, you know? So, um, so I was really glad the refs moved on with the game and, and I'm, I was thankful Molly buried the, the, well, you know, it was cool. I remember our players talking about this, too, that as Mike was leaving the field, and I was dying to know if you invited him to talk with us tonight, because I almost thought, <laughs> as he was leaving that being, I should say, escorted off the field by the police, he was trying to get his players to come with him, and they were all like, no, dude, <laughs> we're going to keep playing. You keep going. <laughs> like, I was really I, – I think uh, I think their players really deserved a lot of credit for that. I did. I, I was really proud of them. Yeah. yeah. So Molly buries this. Um, it was, again, to, to frame the game, Asheville City had to win. We could not draw the game and make the playoffs. Um, Beaufort could have um, won or drawn and made the playoffs. We're up 1-0. And knowing the stakes – it, that that goal was cathartic. That goal was um, it. It was emotional. 
It was Pride Night. And it truly turned, you know, it, it turned the tides. We, um, the next week, went on to play um, Oak City in Raleigh in the playoffs. And then we eventually end up in Charlotte playing the Eagles. We had played the Eagles twice before that season, um, neither one to particularly great results. Um, the first game down in Charlotte was one of the worst games I've ever seen Asheville City play, uh, very disconnected, playing from the back to the front, um, frustrating. You could tell the the players were frustrating. If it wasn't for an amazing game by Bryson Lee, I'm pretty sure that game, the scoreline would have been a little bit, you know, even heavier um, for the Eagles. And then they came to um, Asheville and, and they put it to us again. But when we played them in the playoffs, it was even. It It was – unlike anything I'd ever seen from Asheville City before. Stacey, what do you account the change in going into that third game against the Eagles, knowing that we had struggled with them twice before, knowing that they you know, had our number and we played them tooth and nail. And if it wasn't for, um, you know, an amazing hat trick by an amazing player for them in the dying minutes of the 88th minute or whatever it was, um, we would have went to extra time, much like the men had the previous week. Yeah, I think when you have something to prove and, you know, you're you're coming together um, and you were the pride, we had a lot of pride and, um, you know, who we are as a team. And it's painful. I mean, it, it is – it is. You get that Band-Aid pulled off, man, it is painful to lose to a team that that you're really, you know, you just, you want to prove something. So not just for yourself, but, you know, you want to play for your teammates and you you know you could play better. And so I, I was so proud of our team. I thought um, it took us a while to get the midfield. I thought, you know, they were con- dominating us in the midfield. It was a up and back game. Um, and then I feel like we calmed down and then we started playing, but you know what, when, when they got up on us and we leveled it, um, it was, it was just a high. And then, you know, we could have sat back when they took a, the lead again and we just had something to prove that night. And I was, you know, they were going to die out on the field. They were going to leave it all out on the field. And that's exactly what we asked. We asked every one of them, you know, you got to leave it out on the field and um, nobody held anything back. And so to level it again. um, And, you know, I mean, I think there were like five goals in seven minutes um, and it was a big push to the end. And I think both teams deserve a lot of credit. Everybody was pushing as hard as they could. Um, And it just, it came down to unfortunate, um, you know, error, um, not just, you know, not just on, you know, in the net, but, you know, just making some mistakes in the end, you know, giving up free kicks. Um, and, uh, and, but, you know, I feel like, um, you know, we wouldn't have gotten there if we hadn't been able to bond as a team overall, we wouldn't have been in that conference league game final if we all hadn't really pulled together right in the middle of the season and made a big push. And so that game, I think, think, was everybody saying, okay, we're Asheville City. Super proud of them. So we were heading into this season with, again, high expectations. The table had shook out a little bit differently. Again, we were going to be faced with um, new teams, new clubs that we hadn't faced before. We had announced, I think, most of our roster um, I think I, I know of a few more who were coming in. Lydia, what do you think the season would have looked like for Asheville City if we had actually been able to play? Ah. What? Space? Go ahead. <laughs> um, you know, I, I was super excited, and I know everyone else was. I mean, most of our players knew or had played for Carolyn or Hoftig, Um and so, yeah, we were just really building momentum. And like Stacey said, I think that last game really kind of validated for a lot of players, you know, the level that we can play at. Um, and so, yeah, I think it – yeah, we were expecting to win, you know. We expect nothing less than being able to get to the national final. So, 
um, I think we had a great squad and, and, and I think the conference, the way that it had evened out or paired out, um, really put us in a good position. Megan, what were you expecting from this season? Megan, when I chat with you on the podcast, um, you know, we obviously go all over the place. Other than maybe on the pitch, do you think Asheville City would have seen um, more involvement from the community? Do you think our attendance would have gone back up? Um, What do you think Pride Night would have looked like this year? You know, I I haven't allowed myself to think about that. because I think this year would have been epic I really Mm -hmm. I think we were top to bottom ready to win the WPSL and bring it home um I think a lot of the issues we'd had look we're you know to be talking about that in their first year much less your third year every player who's ever worn the Asheville City is part of anything we do moving forward um and we're eternally grateful to them and by virtue of being something new, you, you learn as you go. You know, you make mistakes, you figure out where your weaknesses are. And I feel like we'd really worked hard this off season to address some of our weaknesses. Um, you know, we had a really, really strong team. We had, I think, the best schedule we could have hoped for under the constraints that we work within. We had the best nights we could have hoped for. Um, mm-hmm. We had more weekend nights. We, you know, Pride Night was slated to be – I don't even want to talk about it because it was just going to be awesome. It was going to be a double header with like, you know, we, we talked to Reed Churchy about coming and performing. I mean, like, I really think, um, you know, the parking issues, I think were a big part of why our attendance was down last year. And we'd been able to come up with some creative ideas I don't want to talk about. So that way it can be a surprise <laughs> next year. Um, you know, I think we'd really worked hard. We always have constraints. And so that's not to say it would have been flawless or, um, you know, that we necessarily would have achieved our, all our goals. But I think it was reasonable to expect that our attendance, average attendance would have been higher than ever. Our max attendance would have been the highest it had ever been. Pride night would have been a success, and I think we would have won, won the WPSL championship. And I don't think – I mean, you can't prove me wrong, but prove me wrong. I mean, I think <laughs> – you know, I think uh, – Given that the sun's going down, I'm going to go inside so you guys can see me and I'm not like in a little orange blob. Um, you know, yeah, I, I think it's really hard – that we weren't able to play, but I also think we made, I absolutely stand by our decision and think it was the right one. And so we've got just a few minutes left, but Stacy, do you have any parting shots on what the future of Asheville city looks like? Oh, I mean, it's, um, if you're now that we're, everyone's kind of getting back out in the community and out in the public, um, you know, I had my Asheville City shirt on today, and it's amazing how many comments you get from people. Um, I think our community is missing, you know, what we bring, um, and uh, so that's that's been really positive from a community standpoint. I also get really good emails um, from folks, and uh, players are obviously missing the game, so... Um, uh, so we know Carolyn's agreed to be our coach next year as well, come in and help out. So, you know, I feel like, you know, we just hopefully hit the pause button and we're going to be able to keep what we had intact uh, for this year and bring it back for next. So still hopeful. Lydia, any, any parting thoughts? No, I mean, I think, you know, I think we're all – I think, you know, unfortunately this has happened, but it, it's definitely going to make our organization better um, because I think we're that much more grateful um, and, and really been able to kind of look within ourselves and our organization and, and try to be better in every single area, whether that's our fan experience, our player experience, our coaching staff. Um, it's, it's an amazing group of folks to work with for sure. And you all, the fans and supporters. Yeah, so, I mean, it. come on, South Slope come Blue. The, nobody know. compares. Nobody. 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 I've, I've nobody. seen like soccer. I've been here, there, and everywhere. I've been around the world, and there's nobody like the South Slope Blues. I'm just True saying. That. True that. Well, I, I hope if, if the South Slope Blues can do nothing else, it's to continue to push the momentum. I think the women's game in general is obviously trending in the, you know, 
correct direction. Um, I think USL has some exciting things to do that I hope maybe Asheville City's involved in at some point. Um, I'm, I, I think the unofficial battle that Asheville City and Tulsa was in last year where we traded the attendance record back and forth throughout the course of the season was exciting. Detroit City is starting a women's club and I guarantee you they're going to blow that attendance number out of the water. I fully expect four or five, 6,000 for some of their games, maybe a home and home friendly, just putting it out there. Um, <laughs> but I, I think we're doing everything right. I couldn't be more excited. I'm looking forward to uh, twisting Ryan's arm into a uh, splash third alternative jersey, maybe one yes. year. Yeah. Uh, to pay some um, homage to um, maybe nice. the pre-origins of Asheville City. But um, I just want to thank all three of you for joining me this evening. I want to thank all three of you for everything you've brought to our city. Um, thank you for representing us, and long may it continue. Oh, thanks, Tim. Thank uh, you. Thank you. I guess that's why they call us the blues. Time